Right, folks, thank you very much for waiting. Today we are starting our very short, but hopefully very insightful uh, extension of the bioinformatics workshop series. And uh, to help me out today, I have invited Clement, which is a longtime collaborator. And uh, he's going to talk about one of his passions, which is transposable elements. I'm going to leave it to Clement to actually tell us a lot more about it, since he is the expert around here. So, so by all means, uh, thanks to Clement and the Wheeler Lab for collaborating. And uh, Clement, pleasure. The, the floor is yours. Right. So uh, hello, everybody. Thank you, Mikhail, for the invitation. Ed. I'm super happy to present this uh, workshop where we are going to uh, talk about how to we find a transposable element in new genome assemblies and how we annotate these genomes. Uh, so, uh, but before I start a few, uh, a little bit of um, practical things, I'm going to share in the Zoom uh, uh, chat. And for you here, you'll see it on the screen. Uh, or if you connect to the Zoom, you can have the link as well. Uh, a link where you're going to find all the materials. So there are the slides. There are going to be the handouts of what we are going to do today uh, with the command lines and a few extra information, uh, and uh, as well as a little toy data set that we are going to use today and we will need to, to download. So I'm going to share that now. Meanwhile, I'm going to share the presentation with you. Okay, so... I uh, think I'm going to go this way. I hope it's not going to be too small. Otherwise, I can try. Oh, let me do something. Oh. All right. I can see this is working because I don't even have to ask. Uh, so if uh, anyone online, especially at any time, you have any question, need to clarify something or uh, yes, in, in probably that uh, or ask a question, uh, please. Um, make some virtual noise. Uh, either probably Michele might be able to see if I don't see it that someone is asking for help. But uh, you that are here, just scream my scream and I'll help you. Uh, so for for this um, workshop, as I was uh, talking earlier, we are going to discuss uh, two important things, uh, and I think the fundamental of uh, doing transposable element analysis on any uh, genomic uh, data and. We're going to take the case example of, well, you've assembled a new genome, and what, what now? What, what do we do? How do I find transposons in, in this genome, and how, what data can I generate to start doing some an biological analysis uh, on these transposons? So I'll start with um, 10 minutes of uh, basic uh, and refresher of uh, T-biology, uh, just in order to, for us to have build an expectation of what we might find in a given genome that we assemble. And after that, we'll talk about two successive analyses that usually we do as a pipeline. The first is going to be detecting without any prior in the genome assemb genomic assembly the, trans the different transposable elements that exist and represent them as uh, families. And then we are going to use another tool called Repeat Masker that several of you might have used, uh, heard, because it's the only one tool that is really built for that. Uh, to uh, actually annotate and find instances, individual copy of transposable element in our, in our genome. And if we have time, we'll look at a couple of little downstream analysis in order to uh, get uh, some biology, some interesting biology out of our, our data. So before we talk about uh, actually uh, working on, on uh, putting our hands on actual data, um, I like to show what uh, this figure that is the what we call the TE life cycle is, and it helps us build expectation about what we're going to find in a, in, a, in a given genome. So we're going to start on the top here with active TE. So transposable elements are DNA sequences. They are a very diverse collection of uh, sometimes related, sometimes unrelated uh, sequences that have the ability to make copy of themselves and insert at other loci in the genome. And this uh, leads to a genome, what we can call a, a colonization, by different elements that can jump around and create new copy and uh, disperse themselves within, gen within and between genomes. But uh, you can imagine that such unregulated activity could be quite quickly harmful for the host species. Uh, so very quickly, uh, and if there is enough in the population, selection is going to 
select for mechanism that counter this expansion of T. Uh, this is done through small RNA, methylation, um, and epigenetic modification that are going to silence all these transposons so they, they don't make new copy of themselves. And at this stage, this is most of the T that I've inserted are going to enter a phase of extinction where the copy are going to accumulate mutation and not be, uh, through time, not be very recognizable as they were when they first jump in the genome. And uh, also the genome can uh, rearrange uh, and, um, uh, yes, mostly rearrange and recombine, which are going to break down this copy rather into fragments. And so what we should expect in when we look at the genome is to find a landscape, what we call a landscape of transposable elements that may inclu include recent and older T copies at different states of decay. Uh, so it's not just straightforward looking for things that are identical to each other, because in a given genome, all the copy of transposable elements might have been at different state of decay. Uh, and we're not going to talk about that today, but uh, there are some interesting biological cases, uh, including aging, stress, disease, hybrid, hybrid, hybridization, horizontal transfer, and a positive natural selection or co-option that can, in some instance, revert for some T family this uh, doom, this extinction. But today, let's focus on the, the T landscape. And I'm going to introduce here a, a few uh, um, basic uh, jargon and, and concepts so we can follow along uh, in, the, in the next stage. So a T, by definition, a T is a sequence that is repeated in the genome. Here we have three copies of the same element. And this copy, we can group them into a family, or sometimes we call it subfamily, depending the level of identity. And so within a family, we can see some slight variation. We could have a, a little bit of mutation between the copy. And to reconstruct this family, there are two approaches. Uh, one based on phylogeny, uh, that is probably the most comprehensive, but that could also uh, uh, bring a lot of pitfalls and can be very complicated and sometimes uh, hard to fully resolve. And there are other approaches that are more empirical, less based on biology, but that help us go forward and create repeat, uh, reproducible analysis. And so there is one rule that's called the 80-80-80 rules that stipulates 80% identity between the copy, over 80% of the sequence, et cetera, et cetera. We, it's not very necessary to remember all this detail today, but it's just interesting to know that when we search for T in the genome, we're going to have to deal with this type of um, uh, trade-off between something that is ideal but complicated and something that is empirical and easy but limited. So no matter what uh, way we choose to create this family or subfamily, we have two ways to represent them. Either we can look at the alignment and create a consensus sequence. And some of you that might have dealt with T before might be aware of this uh, concept. And so the consensus sequence is simply the average. You take for each uh, um, variant uh, SNP, for example, in the alignment, you're going to take the base that is the most abundant. Uh, more recently, uh, people have developed a system based on a hidden Markov model, a profile that instead of storing the average sequence, they will store the probability of each base at each position in the alignment uh, to be possible. So it allows you to do to perform searches that are much more sensitive because your database includes information about this variation. And so whether you use a consensus or an HMM profile, we, I'm going to use the term T model or sometimes a representative sequence for T family. It's just this idea that we have many copies in the genome and we need something to store in a database that either is going to be a consensus or HMM profile, but that's going to help us to find them uh, when we want to annotate a genome. And it's also a big demarcation between two important databases that exist. We have RepBase that is based on storing consensus. Uh, sequences and DFAM, where actually I, I partially work with people at DFAM, uh, where we store data as HMM profile. Uh, all in all, you can use both. Uh, both are very important uh, and works with many softwares. Uh, and if you have more questions about the way of storing T in database, um, I'm happy. I'll be happy to answer your, your question, and you, you can reach me, uh, reach out to me by by email. So the first step basically is to that what we want to do uh, uh, when we want to analyze a new genome is to uh, recognize where these families are are anchored in, in the genome. Where, what, where are they at? What position? And so we would be able, like you annotate gene, to annotate T uh, family. However, 
you see here that when we do this this search in the genome, we rely on something that we call a T library. So it's a previous knowledge that you have about the T families that might exist in a genome. And so the whole question is, well, we first need to reconstruct this family before searching it in, in the genome. And how we do that is, is going to be uh, the focus on the first part of this workshop, where we are going to use the software Repeat Modeler 2 to uh, ab initiate or without anything else, right, than the genome, trying to find uh, these different families. Just a few words about how we build usually, uh, or we, we look to, we identify and reconstruct T families. You can have an approach that is purely based on homology. Let's say you have a solid database of transposons for a species you're interested to study, and you don't necessarily want to start from the beginning. So you can use just homology-based approaches. You can also use structure-based approaches that uh, use specific uh, hypotheses and knowledge that you might have about some transposons. So LTR retrotransposons, for example, are uh, specific because they have long terminal repeats, and in the middle, we have an open reading frame. So if you write, write an algorithm that can detect that, you might detect this transposon. However, it's going to be very specialized, so it might not necessarily find all the T that you have in the genome. And so there are a, another set of collection of methods that are called ab initio or de novo that have no prerequisite except the fact that something is repetitive in the genome. And of course, not everything that's repetitive in the genome is a transposon. So you have gene families, you might have satellite DNA, et cetera. But this approach, right, is also, uh, is going to yield a lot of transposable elements. So a better approach is probably to actually combine several of these algorithms into a pipeline that will be best suited, or at least we hope to be the best suited, to discover these T families. And if you want to know more about it, uh, in this, I, the, I, the slide I uh, normally shared with you, so you will see all these references. I recommend this paper, for example, of uh, Jessica Storr, uh, that talk about all these different methods and how they combine. So we are not going to go into that today. Uh, what we're going to do is focus on the software that is called Repeat Modeler 2, and modeler because we're going to create models or representative of these T families. It's been developed by uh, Robert Hugley and Aaron Smith, who also created Repeat Masker. We'll use that later. And Julian Flynn, who uh, during a PhD was interested in, in improving this method. And so we worked together to uh, build up a new version, an updated version of Repeat Modeler. And Repeat Modeler is pretty simple to use. Uh, and because it's simple to use, uh, it's been it's widely, widely used. Probably 50% of the paper genome uh, uh, nowadays would use a repeat modeler at least to start up with a, a, a T library. So what I suggest that we do now is um, we are going to actually put our hands uh, in the command line right now and start a run a repeat modeler. And while it'll be running, uh, we can talk a little bit more about how this software actually works, detect you. So I think at this point, if you have any question about what I said before, it would be great. And otherwise, uh, we'll go and try to connect to the VM. I think, Michele, maybe you can uh, give a little tutorial. All right, for this next section, we are going to be using virtual machines. And uh, these are virtual machines that are currently running on the OpenStack cloud, and we access them through something called Jetstream 2. Um, I shared with the folks that are connected on this call uh, a Google Docs. I can see someone else also joining in. I see Mona. Okay, there you go. Uh, please do go ahead and uh, click on that link. Let me share my desktop quickly. Oh, sure. Uh, I have your email. Let me email you. Just just a second. Let me finish this. And um, Okay. okay, so what so you're going to see here is a set of uh, user IP addresses and the passwords. Now, what is expected of you in order for you to go on and uh, use the repeat masker and other tools, you will have to connect via SSH to a number of virtual machines. I have 10 set virtual, virtual machines for today. for today. Please go Please ahead go and, and uh, type uh, in type your in name you're on, on the right, right which, which will, will uh, essentially lock you, you in so that no one else actually uses your machine. Um, uh, as you can see, as you can I see, have uh, instructor uh, and IP address, but address for this for sample, sample, I'm going to be using um, uh, user 10. So I'm just going to type in my name, 
And I'm gonna, and you, gonna will you will require to for this. For this. I'm gonna do it side do by it side. side. What well, I want you to do at this point well, is to pick, pick a username. A, so in this specific uh, case, I have username 10 and uh, type in SSH. I see a I chat. See it's very noisy now. Maybe, I don't know why it was noisy. Sorry, Simona. Can you, you hear, hear me, me better, better now? now? Okay, I'm gonna keep on talking. If it is if it is uh, noisy, do let me know. Okay, cool, fantastic. Um, all right. If you've never used an SSH uh, or used SSH in order to connect to a server, you need a terminal. So please open up a terminal and type in SSH. In this specific case, I am user ten, so I'm gonna type in user ten, and I'm gonna do an add and connect to a specific IP address that is assigned to user ten. Here, I'm then going to press enter and I'm prompted by a fingerprint where I can then say yes. And here, it's going to ask me for a password. I'm going to copy this password and paste it in the in the field. If you have never used um, Linux or if you've never used SSH, your password will not show. I just pasted it. Uh, therefore... Once you paste it, press enter, and you should be met with something similar to this. If I look at what tools I see here, um, cover images, there should be the tools and uh, Docker containers that you require. I do not see. I think we cannot edit. You cannot edit. Okay, one thing at a time. Hold on a second. Um, one thing at a time. People asking for edit permissions. Um, anyone with the link is now an editor. Done. There we go. Okay. Uh, Clement, yeah. I think this is all I wanted mm -hmm. to okay. run. Uh, I'm going to send John, John, John. Uh, mm -hmm. an email for this. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing, um, and I'll hand hand it back to you. Okay. Yes. yes. Oh. Okay. So what I what we what I plan on doing what we can do is whenever each of you has connected uh, successfully to the virtual machine, uh, let us know in the chat. Say yes, I'm connected. All good or if you are encountering a problem, let us know now, because uh, if there is anything, we, we, we have a little bit of time to, to fix it, and then we need to start a couple of uh, our analysis, so we have time to actually do it throughout. Uh, and of course, we are going to be using a toy data set today, uh, so it's, it's, uh, there's, um, uh, it's scaled, so normally everything is gonna be done in the, within the hour, and even less. So now I have pulled up uh, the second document that uh, we have shared with you, that is the handout uh, with the objectives and command lines and a few extra information about what we are going to do, to do today. Uh, so while everybody is getting there, is getting to connected, uh, I can give you a bit of background about uh, the analysis we are going to perform. Uh, since we are uh, in Tucson and uh, I love going around and see those beautiful saguaros, I was like, Hmm, I think this could be a great model for, for today, uh, given that it's also a species with a very a big genome and a lot of transposable elements in this, in this genome. Uh, so what I did, just grab one contig of the genome assembly of, uh, the, of the saguaro, and we are going to run our program on it. So of course, what we, the results we're gonna have are not gonna be extremely comprehensive or represent what exactly is going on in the, in the complete genome, but it gives us the basic uh, about how to perform the standard analysis. And this, the pipeline I'm going to show you today is basically what's the minimum required when you would publish a genome and want to talk about the T inside. So you might want to say, well, there is 10% of T in my genome. That could be the minimum thing you, you want to add in a genome paper. Uh, and uh, you might want to, you might wonder what, 
how do I go with that? Right? How, where, where do I start? So uh, before I go further, are we all good with uh, and connected? And uh, where do I know that? Yes. Seems good for everybody. If not, just let us know. I'll pause and we'll make sure everybody is there. Uh, so the overview of the pipeline today is we are, it's, it looks quite simple. We are going to have a single input file that is technically a genome in FASTA, FASTA format. Uh, here it's going to be just a chromosome. Um, not even actually, just a counting. We're going to use repeat modeler 2 to find the repeated family, to find the repeated family. And then with repeat masker, we will annotate the genome. We'll go back, annotate the genome, and we'll have a lot of data that can be further parsed for uh, interpretation. So uh, let's start with repeat modeler 2. So as I was saying, it's a pipeline that take a genome in input, search for repeated families, and uh, it use sequence to sequence homology to find cluster of similar sequence and some refinement refinement algorithm to curate and improve what is the beginning what is the end for example of a given t sequence to represent them into families so the expected output of repeat modeler is a file a couple of file actually where you are going to have a list of t families that you can use to annotate your genome so without uh, further waiting we can uh, start our work and i'm going to pull my terminal here. Uh, if big bigger and yes, I see it on the screen, so I assume that you are seeing. It. So we, when you connect, you are in the home. We can uh, just check that we're home. And me, it says user one, and you, it's gonna say whatever user you are. The first thing we are going to do is create a data directory where we are going to put our input files, and we are also gonna store our output files. So this is quite straightforward with mkdir data. And if I do ls, I see that my directory is present here. And now that we have that, uh, I have to read my handout to remember the next step. <laughs> we are going to start the container. So mm, several of you might not be familiar with using container, con container tools within container. Uh, it has the great advantage of uh, having nothing to install, which could be problematic. It has the drawback of being a little bit uh, of, a, of a, some brain gymnastics to use. Uh, but uh, if you copy these comments, everything should work smoothly. And if you have more detailed com uh, a question about Docker, uh, Docker or container in general, you can ask us, so we'll be happy to, to help you with that. But basically what we're going to do here is spin off this uh, container that represents, that contain everything we need, including an operating system to run these tools. And what's very important is that we are going to connect our data directory to a directory in this container. So this is, here we are in home user something slash data. And in the container, we will access it directly st through slash data. You'll see by practicing it, it, it's a little bit more straightforward. So if you copy the command, it should spin off the uh, container. Oh, yeah, certainly. The command to start the container? Yes. Uh, simply because it needs to be the input points. Definitely. I just need to find out ah, there. <laughs> so I'll do that. I'll, I'll copy and pass the command as the as I as I put them also. So we uh, we know we are connected to the to the Docker container because our prompt has changed here. Before it was saying user something, and now we we have this uh, defam t tools. This is the name of the container, and we know that we are actually in this directory, but this is not important. So let's move to the directory that is connected with our virtual machine, where we actually can have data and expo export data. It's the the directory is slash data. So if I do cd for change directory data, I'm going to be in the right place. If I do ls to check what's in, in there, nothing so far. So we are going to download our data set. And I'm going to copy the command uh, as well in the chat. So the data set is, as I was saying, this little chromosome uh, that is accessible here. So here, wget is the tool to download from the internet. Uh, and I specify this URL uh, that is actually pointing to a FASTA file that is our chromosome. So the, for me, the, the download is, is complete. I'm 
you come here. We can check our genome is here. We can even do head of oh, not this. No, no. You can do head of the genome. Oh, this sequence. Well, it looks like DNA. Oh, look, look at that. Turn them repeats. But this is not how we analyze it. <laughs> you don't have to use your eyes, actually. So, but we know our data is here, right? So we have our genome. That's perfect. So at this point, we are ready to start our analysis. And uh, as you know, many tools that study uh, works on genome, before doing the actual crunching the data and, and working on the things, they are, need some indexing on preparation of the of the source file. So here we are we are going to build a database that is simply some slight modification of the genome that's going to allow repeat modeler to do a better search. Uh, and so the command is as it is. It's called a tool called build that build database. It's included with repeat modeler, and we are going to give a name to our a project that we're going to call it Sawaro. And we're going to say, OK, you build the database on this file, the technically the genome here, just this content. So here's the link for everyone. So this is very short because it's a it's quite a small chromosome. It's 2.5 megs or 2 megs, 2 megabytes. Um, sorry, 2 megabase. Uh, so it's it's um, it should be fairly, fairly quick. It can take a few minutes. Uh, up to maybe half an hour if you have a big genome, but should not be extremely long. The search that we're going to do is a bit longer, and here should take around 10 minutes. Uh, but for a genome like the Saguaro, I would expect a real run to run over a couple of days, if not more. Um, this is, of course, something that you, you can scale by using uh, a lot of CPU in parallel. Uh, and if you have specific projects and you need you run into this problem, you can contact me and I'd be happy to help you on how to scale the program to, to your data. But for now, it's quite straightforward. So we're going to call repeat modeler and we're going to tell it to work on the Saguaro database. And we are going to give it this instruction that is LTR struct. What does this mean? It means we ask repeat modeler to use his pipeline using a structural search uh, specifically to search for LTR. Uh, retrotransposons. This is an add-on, basically, to repeat modeler that increase its sensitivity for this type of element. And since we work on a plant genome, uh, plants have a lot of this type of element. So it's kind of a, a good thing to use. In general, it's actually good to use all the time. It, it cannot make it worse. And we are going to ask two threads, but know that you can go as much as you can uh, on the machine uh, for personal run with the with you, whatever you, you can have, the, the more the merrier. And so we're going to launch that. And this is going to take a little bit longer. So we, it says a bunch of things that I'm going to detail a little bit uh, now, especially what does it mean round one, et cetera, what is, it, what is actually going on. So, But before that, I just want to make sure that everybody has caught up with this stage. Uh, and then in a couple of minutes, we'll go back to the slides where I have a few of these slides that detail what repeat moderator is doing. And so we can look back at the terminal to see if that fits right. It's what I say is actually what it does. Yeah, I'm, I'm taking a little uh, wait time. So everybody is catching up. Yeah, so we had a question here locally <laughs> where uh, the question was, is uh, re the repeat moderator is searching the T right now, right? Is searching in the FASTA file reading the FASTA file. And we, we'll see in a, in a minute, what it does is actually sampling this file, looking for just uh, exemplar of the sequences and compare them. Here, it's a very small uh, contig, input contig, so it, it could technically search everything versus everything. But as genome are big, it's a very computationally intensive. So sampling approach is usually uh, what is used in, with, this, uh, with this method to initially create and, and find repeated families. Uh, is it all good for you? Okay, perfect. So uh, I'm going to go back to the slides. Yes, we can see that, perfect. To discuss a little more what, what is actually uh, repeat model are doing. So the idea, as I was saying, is to sample your genome and compare this uh, exemplar of sequence that we collect to see if we have anything repeated in there. So we can imagine our genome here at the top with two families that would exist in this genome. You can notice that they are not the same length because what usually happens is that as they decay and the genome recombine, we lose bits and pieces 
of the older copies. So usually this is what the T landscape should look like. So our first run is going to take a few samples and then compare them all v all. And in that case, only the sequence uh, of the blue family can find enough overlap between our samples to really reassemble a complete version of this element. So uh, one run usually yield more than one family. This is just for the example here. But basically, in, in this theoretical first run, and you can see that right now, your um, repeat model should be at run one as well. It creates a bunch of first model. And usually, the first run is going to find what is very repeated and very recent. So copies that are very much uh, looking alike. And then we store this model or this representative of the family in our T library. And we are going to go back to a sampling step. But before that, and sorry, we go back, we do a new round of sampling, take new sequences. But before we go further in our samples, we are going to use our library of discovery to mask, meaning identify and uh, transform into a N or X. So we don't search for it again, basically. So we iteratively find a family, we erase them from the genome, take a new sample, and find increment, finding new families. And so in that case, we would have masked the blue family, and we have only the representative of the green family. We can assemble them, and we have identified a second family. And so repeat, mask, a repeat modeler is going to do that up to six times, and usually a couple of run are enough to kind of saturate and find most of the T family. But in some cases, it can take up to six, uh, six, six rounds. And with that, here we can look at a, a bit more detailed uh, version of what, what we've done. I was saying we have six rounds of sampling, but the first round of sampling is actually quite different than the five others, because the first round use a tool that is called Repeat Scout. And this, this tool is based on KMER search. So very fast, very quick, but not a lot of difference between the sequences. Later, for the round two to six, the core of the algorithm is done by Blast and Recon. And Recon is greedy, slow, but it can find more diverged families. So basically, at the end of all this run, everything is combined together. Redundancy is removed. And we use the LTR structural uh, detection uh, add-on uh, currently, which is um, um, described here. So everything that come out of this, all this search, round one, round two to six, as well as the LTR uh, add-on are combined. And often there are some redundancy. So we have a clustering algorithm that get rid of uh, duplicated families. And repeat modeler will next attempt to classify this element. A little word on classification before going further. It's not the purpose of our workshop here. It's a very complicated topic in the field. Uh, it's very hard to automate. Uh, in that case, the way it's done is repeat modeler includes a database of T protein and some T. And so it's able to recognize the most recognizable T. But you, as you will see, it doesn't recognize everything. And it's really the, the most challenging thing in this field. So it's don't be afraid if you do this type of analysis and don't classify everything. Uh, and if you want to talk more about classification of transposable elements, you can reach out to me as well. I'll be happy to, to chat with you. So if I go back now to my thumbnail, hopefully things will be done. Not yet. <laughs> Michele, come on. Uh, the machine could be faster. No, I'm, jo I'm joking. I'm joking. It's, it's, uh, we should be very quick. What, was the, what is usually the longest is the step uh, before. Uh, that is the round two. So. Round one, as I say, it's it used a uh, repeat uh, scout. We can see it here, running repeat scout. And this was pretty, pretty fast. And it found 17 families. And then round two, we take a sample. We're going to use the 17 family to erase, to mask them, whether they are present in the sample, and use this other tool called Recon that is much slower, much more sensitive, to try to find more families. So this is the round two. There is a a new sample that is that is taken from our from our genome, and things are being compared and assembled. And this step here that you can see uh, takes a while to go up to 100%. Uh, at least it, this is the bulk of the analysis. And here 
it, it stops, it says we found 23, 23 families. So that's 23 more families. Um, and what is uh, very interesting is that you don't see run three, four, five. The algorithm has felt that it's rich enough. Uh, it would not find much more family by resampling again. This is very simple because here we just have a small input and actually our sample size is, might be larger than the thing we give it. So we, it's very likely that we have looked at everything that we could. Um, next is the LTR uh, analysis. Uh, LTR stands, since I have time, I'm gonna talk a little bit about it. LTR uh, stands from long terminal repeat element. They are retro transposons. Uh, so from this name, they actually means they look a lot a lot like retroviruses. Retroviruses such as AIDS or herpes, for example, have this long terminal repeat, and that uh, that are on either the beginning and the uh, either at both sorry both beginning and the end in the same <laughs> sorry <laughs> both in the same orientation, uh, and in the middle you have one or more open reading frames that encode the enzymes that the T require for making copy of itself and reintegrate in the in the DNA. And the tool that uh, Repeat Modeler is using is called LTR Harvest and LTR Retriever that have been specially designed to scan the genome for this specific pattern of long terminal repeat separated by an open reading frame. And it does a lot of clever thing to identify all the copies and then group them into families. Also something interesting about LTR is that because the two LTR are identical, they can recombine uh, by uh, pairing to, to themselves and so, uh, the product of this recombination, recombination is the loss of the internal sequences. And what you will only observe in the genome is a solo, what we call solo LTR. So at this stage, you cannot see that it's an LTR, only if you have assembled the full length. So this is what this uh, software does and really uh, improve the sensitivity of the software for specifically this, this type of element. So it's getting very close uh, to completion. That's it, <laughs> perfect for me, but maybe it's still running for, for uh, some of you. And maybe you have a um, question. So if you want, you can ask in, in the chat or here, uh, I can uh, reply to that. Uh, and I'm happy to see that we, are, we have plenty of time to, to do the rest. Yes. Mm -hmm. So actually, if you the question is if you are not interested necessarily only in LTR, you want to look at other T. Well, the first step, everything that is around one, two, or three, are going to assemble everything, anything that is repeated. So it can include this T that are not LTR. And it could also include this LTR, but we make sure at the end that we don't do twice the same thing. Uh, so this is taken care of. However, you might have some what is going to miss the most likely is when you have T that are at low copy number in the genome. That exists that sometimes one family is only present in one or two copies. And because we sample the genome randomly, we might just miss it because if it's a couple of copies and never assemble them. Uh, however, you could be lucky and it looks a lot like another family that you have assembled. So in my biomology, eventually you might be able to find them again. Uh, but you might also want to apply on the top of repeat modeler here, spe specialized program. That would be, oh, for helitron element, for example. And you will find that, and at the end of the handout, there is a list of other programs that you, you might want to look at. Some that actually encapsulate repeat modeler in larger pipeline, and they do a lot of uh, extra analysis and, and com combination of tools uh, in order to hopefully uh, uh, kind of facilitate this uh, detection and annotation process. But it's very, I, I'm showing you here the most basic bare bone pipeline uh, in one hand, because as you try to use more complex um, um, kind of uh, one does it all type of tool, uh, it's very hard, it's very easy, sorry, to be quickly lost, but also it's uh, in some cases could be hard to be fully reproducible as you combine many tools and uh, it's very important to take super good notes if you want to publish or someone can do it again. So I prefer usually going something that might be incomplete. We, you might miss on finding all the family or you might miss on classifying perfectly, but it's very reproducible. Uh, so that's my approach, but uh, 
look at the program I, I mentioned at the end of the of the little handouts and, and um, you you can ask me about about them. I'll be happy to help you. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to assume that your silence is that everybody has, is, has caught up and things are, are working. So what we can do now is quickly look at our, the output of repeat model. So if you do LS, you're going to see a bunch of things have shown up. Uh, and what's the most important is the two files that say families. One is families.fa, so we can expect fast A sequences there. And uh, STK, that is, means Stockholm, it's, there are multiple alignments, basically, of the same families. So if I look a little bit uh, at this file, Saguaro family.fa, here, I see that I have indeed a bunch of sequence that have been uh, labeled. This one is long. Oops. So we can, so for example, the first one, it's, it's very interesting because it looks like we have a lot of 80 simple repeat. You will, of course, assemble things that are not on ET, but repeated thing. And some genome contain a lot of simple repeats like that. Uh, and you see that it was like, well, I don't know what this is. I call it unknown. Uh, however, this one here, this family round one, family one, it means that it was found during the first round, uh, has been classified as LTR copia. So LTR, uh, we talked about it. Uh, they are, and copia in particular, are very abundant in the sour genome and in plant genome in general. So you can see it's quite long. Uh, this is uh, usually sequences T that are between 8 and 10 uh, KB in length. So here we have all our consensus sequence. So consensus because each of these sequence has multiple copy in the genome that we are, we are looking at right now. And you see many have a known, this is completely normal, and we see another LTR, etc. We can have a quick look at the Stockholm file that contain as many family as in the FASTA file. So actually, let's count, sorry, how many family we've assembled here. So we can use this little grab command. So 23 families for a little bit of the, of the genome. And we should have, uh, next we should have this 23 family represented in the Stockholm format. So I look, you can see it's a little bit more different. Uh, you have usually a header that uh, the header uh, is indicated by using uh, hashtags and the name, etc. But then you, instead of a one sequence, you have a multiple sequence alignment. And for time, I'm going to let you look at that. If you have questions, please reach out to me uh, because I would like to move on to using repeat masker. That is probably uh, the most exciting part because we are going to actually annotate the genome and try to uh, predict how much T are taking up on this uh, genome. So if I go back to the handout here, so here, here are a few details and same, if you have question about it, please reach out to me, I'll be, I'll be happy to help you. So now we're gonna move on to the second part uh, of, the, of this analysis, that is not that we have created a bag with, look at it. Sorry, um, we all know what that is, but where's Stockholm? Yes, so Stockholm, it's a multiple sequence alignment format that is used in all, that is the kind of uh, go-to format for everything that is based on search with uh, HMM profile. So an HMM profile is this probabilistic sequence. So for each column in your alignment, you have, instead of having one base, you have a probability that a given base is coming. Uh, and when you work with a tool like uh, Amer or HMR, uh, that is very, very sensitive, uh, you need to provide uh, um, HMM. And so to create this HMM profile, you use a Stockholm file by default, right? So PFAM, protein family database, DFAM for transposable element, use this format as the base of the, instead of storing one sequence, they store a sequence element. Thank you for your question. All right, so now we have our family in the bag, right? And we are going to use uh, the, actually to be fast, but also because this is the most common way of doing it, uh, we are going to use our fast A file, our list of consensus sequence. And we are going to use repeat masker, a tool that is quite similar to BLAST, but has been modified to be actually much more sensitive and use, if you, are, if you know a little bit about sequence alignment, use transition matrices that are more, um, more representative of transposable elements. So, 
but you can see it as a blast. The only difference with a blast is that it does a competitive search. So it's going to try for different families. Maybe you have two families that look alike and that could be competing for hit in the genome. So repeat masker as an algorithm that automatically sort that out so you don't have to, uh, and does it in a way that should be the best at representing T instances on the, on the genome. So let's run repeat modeler and then we can look at the briefly look at the res, uh, repeat masker, sorry, and look at the result. So I copy the comment here, I give it to you here, and I'm gonna go there and my time now. So we stay in the right, the same place, just should run repeat masker. And as it's running, you can say that it's a search engine and CBI are in BLAST N. So this is a modifi mo the modified version of BLAST N that is used here. You can use repeat masker with HMM profile. You can specify this. Uh, this is a little bit more compli complicated, so uh, for another time maybe. So here it says it's gonna divide the work in 36 batches, and as you can see, it's pretty quick. And once again, you can really see that as a competitive search, a competitive blast if you if you want, but a bit more sensitive. We can also look at the parameter uh, that I'm using. And I encourage you to all the time, at least use this parameter. Dash S means sensitive, slow search. This is the default that most people use. Uh, dash A is to produce an extra file that contain all the alignments. This is useful for downstream analysis uh, that are based on the di divergence between the copy and the consensus sequence, and that help us interpret the evolution of T as they spend more time in the genome, they accumulate more mutations. So we need that uh, for the analysis that is called the T landscape. Dash GFF will produce a GFF file that you can directly load in a, in a genome browser, um, for example, IGV or the UCSC genome browser. And a dash lib indicate which lib library we use. Here we use the library we just created with a repeat modeler. PA1, we want one uh, CPU running on this. There are some info about the CPU, but once again, on your own machine, as much as possible, it's gonna be the fastest. And the last argument is our, fa uh, our genome. So here, just one contig, but normally it would be the genome you used. I put a lot of info here and a lot of info about the uh, result, but what I'm gonna do instead of uh, going there, I'm gonna show you live. So if I do ls now, I have a little bit more in my um, directory. And the first thing I always look at is this one that you're gonna see all the output of repeat masker, use the name of your genome, .fa, .something. So I'm gonna look at the .tbl for table. That is a very rough, uh, this is not what you use for publishing, but it is quite uh, convenient uh, for a very rough summary of, of our analysis. So if I do more, or let's say cut of this, I have a little table. And the first thing you want to look at is base masked and the percentage. So it means how many base in our genome have been associated, found to be T. Here we see 21.66%. Uh, I would assume that if we had run that on the whole genome, we will find a little more. Uh, usually plants have a ton of them and the bigger the genome, the, the more the T. But this is not uh, the, the point here. As you can see, we find T in the genome. And it's also classified or broken down by classification. But as I was saying, this is a rough summary thing. And we are, I'm going in an instant to show you how to actually generate a better and more uh, in-depth um, um, summary that will tell you for each family that we had given in the library, how much base they represent in the, in the genome. But this is quite useful if you deal with a lot of data and then just want to have a, a quick heads up. We can also look at the dot out, that is the main output of a repeat uh, mod a masker. So this type of file, it's, it's a table. It has a three, three line header and the different information. Basically, you would read that a little bit like uh, like a BLAST output. We have our query sequence here. So this is uh, the, the genome that we, are, that we are using. And instead of taking a family, T of family, and searching it against the genome, it's actually a genome that is cut into pieces and search against our family. So this is uh, a point to keep in mind, even though 
at the end, at the end of the day, it doesn't uh, do much, but it helps understanding the, uh, sorry, I'm dealing with the Zoom window here. Okay, so we have interesting things. So for example, we know that for this uh, genome and this region from here to here, we have this repeat, it's like simple repeat. But for example, a little bit later, we have a bit of our copy element, copy element again, and then some unknown. So you can see that as basically an annotation track. This is the native uh, repeat masker format that is actually based on cross match, uh, which it's not very important, but this is a legacy type of format. Uh, we can, uh, what you would probably use the most is the GFF version. So it's just a conversion of this table into a GFF file that you can load in a, in a genome browser. Uh, what I want to do before we run out of time is generate our summary um, file. And so for this, what, what's great is that repeat, uh, this container that contain repeat model, repeat masker, contain all the tool you need to do some downstream analysis, at least start with it. So what we are going to do is build the summary and with a, uh, a program called build summary, which only take as a parameter, one single parameter, it's the dot out, the main output of repeat masker. So with this, it's very quick. We can look at it. And here we have a very detailed count of each of the family. So it starts with all these simple repeat. These are, we didn't actually uh, build them with repeat modeler. They are already in repeat masker because they are expected to occur. So very simple type of repeat. So let's skip them and look at our family. So these are all the family that were in our database that we had uh, built up before and now we, we search them. So we can see that some uh, are there at very low frequency. Some represent 3%, for example, of the quantity. It's, it's, it's quite a lot uh, for 2.2. Two two uh, megabases, for example, et cetera, et cetera. So, if you wanted to say, oh well, so you can of course, this is not indicated here, but in our, your FASTA file, the family file, you would have the complete classification. So you could group and sum this by class of T. You could say, oh, I have that many LTR elements, that many DNA elements, etc. Or you can just sum it all and say, I have this amount, uh, twenty-one point sixty-six percent of repeated DNA, you might want to, you know, only talk about T versus all the type of repeat. Well, here you have the basic data to, to start this, this analysis. And with that, where I'm gonna show you how to do an, a, another analysis that we call a landscape. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm rushing a little bit for time, but once again, if you have a question, just ask me, I'll be very happy to help you with this analysis. So let's make the landscape using these two commands here. This will use the align, the alignment to get the divergence. And I will explain you in a minute what the, does that mean. And then the second command here is to produce a graph directly in an HTML format that you can download and look at it. So it does a lot of things for you. You could of course get this raw data and do it your own way. But just for uh, the sake of time here, we can do that. So what I do next is I open a new window and I'm going, I'm in mm, random place actually, but it's fine. Uh, I'm going to download uh, what we just created. So technically it should work this way. You're gonna do SCP with your, whatever user number you are and the address IP, IP that you were using and everything else should be uh, identical. So. Here, this is me. Just copy this. And don't forget the dot at the end, it means copy it here. Okay, it's not working. I did something wrong, of course. No, uh, the opposite maybe, no. Am I using the right one? Yeah, well, we might not, well, you know what? Okay, it's not a problem because I have it already done. So I'm gonna show you. <laughs> I'm gonna show you how it works. Uh, let's see, where do I have this? So if you follow all the instruction, you will be a bit more lucky than me and be able to 
um, to do that. So just a couple of slides and I'm done. Uh, what, what is a T landscape? So it's a representation of our different T families, or actually of the copies of the different T, uh, uh, represented in an histogram as um, by the distribution of the divergence between the copy and the consensus. And how does that work is if we have an old T family that evolved many, many, many years ago, um, the copy have accumulated a lot of mutation. So they are very different from the consensus sequence we search, we use to search in the genome. Whereas a young family will have a few, very little di differences between the copy. And so it will look younger. So in this graph here on the right, we should have a distribution of younger family to the left and older family to the right. And if you follow all this instruction, we, you will end up with a graph a little bit like that that break down by div divergence, you can see as going back in time, are different repeat. And so quick interpretation here, we see that the red family are more skewed to the left, to the zero kind of divergence. And this means they are the younger family. So family from the DNA CMC class seems to be to have evolved more recently in this genome than uh, family from LTR, GPC and Copia that are represented here in green. And much older are these line L1 element, that is another category, that seems to have been evolving much more back uh, in time. So with this type of graph, you already get some insight. You know, how oh, I have 20% of T in my genome, and I have different families, some being recent, some being older. So the rest is up to you. But if you have more questions, of course, I'd be happy to, to answer. And uh, also, if you're interested to know more, to do more T analysis, and you want me to do more tutorial like that, you can, uh, you can let me know, and I'd be happy to do so. And with this, I'm done, Nikita. Thank, thank you. you. All right, thank you very much. Are there any burning questions for Clement right now? Because if there aren't, then I would like to see you again next week. Next week, if you are coming in person, we are not going to be here. We are going to be at Catalyst um, Studios in the main library. Uh, but by all means, thank you very much, Clement, for today's no workshop. It's been a pleasure having you. Um, and now, if you're here for Simona and RNA sequencing, we're going to have to switch gears a little bit. So please give us a moment. Uh, we also need to get on a different Zoom, but I see people getting on this Zoom, which is quite interesting.